Welcome to another message from God's Word. We're in the 12th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, Katamathi Owen. We want to say hi to all of you out there that support us and pray for us all over the world. Also, the Cowan Brothers in Alabama, each and every one of you, Nick in Texas, and Randy in Texas also, Mike in Texas. We thank you all over this country and all over the world for your prayers to us and your financial help. We need it. All of us have a chance of being good or bad in our lives. We all make decisions. And in the 12th chapter in the verse 9, we see people making those decisions. We watched... Uh, documentary today about the BTK killer. His daughter, a victim. Her mother, a victim. Her brother, a victim. And all of the people that that serial killer killed. They were all victims. And she kept saying one thing over and over and over. He made his choices. He knew right from wrong. He was the president of a Lutheran church and Kansas. Well, we do all make decisions all the time. Some people are very bad, like that person, Dennis, and like Jack the Ripper. If the story is true that Sir William Gull was a, actually the Jack the Ripper, he got by with it because of who he was. He was covered up. If he was that person, he made decisions. He was a real person. This Dennis was a real person. His family were real people. And now we look back in history about some good and bad people good and bad people. One rich young ruler once called him and he said, good teacher. He said, why do you call me good? Only one is good and that is God. Yes, only God is good. But the way you make decisions in your life, it will many times show that you might be a good person or if you are a bank robber, if you are these very terrible people, murderers and things, and you are looked upon as a bad person. We're going to go to Exodus the 20th chapter, Exodus the 20th chapter, and we're going to see the difference between good and evil. Exodus 20th chapter. Now here we have some uh, limits set what is good and what is bad. Exodus 20 and verse 7, You shall not take the Lord, the name of the Lord your God, in vain. For the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Now, how many people do you hear every day if you're out in the workplace, people, especially if you're a roughneck in the oil fields or, or some... Uh, type of welding, welders, and, and uh, hard laborers like that, some of them are really rough people. Bricklayers and carpenters and things, sometimes they just kind of gravitate toward the lower form of life. You see that. You shall not take the name of the Lord their God, name in vain, for he shall require it of you, you shall be punished. That's going to happen. That is going to happen at the great white throne judgment. Right over here at the great white throne judgment. You will be judged for what you have done and if you use God's name in vain, you shall be judged. If you kill people, you shall be judged. If you stole, if you... If you did all of these bad things that we're going to read about here, you shall be judged and you shall be required to answer for it. 
everything that you've done. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But on the seventh day it is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. Now this is Israel that is talking to right here. This is the people of Israel. We're going to find this when we go over to the 12th chapter of the book of Matthew. We're going to see this very edict taking place and what it really meant and what it did not mean. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God, and in it you shall not do any work, you and your son or your daughter, and your male or your female servant, or your cattle, or your guest, your pilgrim, who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea, and made all the heavens and the earth, and the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Why did he do that? Because people use other people. They even use their animals. They used to have what they call blue days. Now, by the way, Sabbath is not Sunday. Did you hear that? Yeah. Sabbath is not Sunday. We're preaching this message on Sunday, and this is not the Sabbath. The Catholic Church made it the Sabbath, but that it wasn't God. It was Catholicism. It was Constantine, not God. Sabbath is from Friday in the evening to Saturday evening. That's the Sabbath. But why did he make the Sabbath? He made the Sabbath so that your animals, your donkeys, your ox, your workhorses didn't have to work. They had one day a week to rest. Because I guarantee you, some farmer is not going to let them rest. And you farm workers out there all over the world. If it was up to your employers, you would work seven days a week. But God intervened for all of the little guys, the little people, and even the animals. And in this, he said, let them rest. Number twelve. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. You shall not keep on murdering. That's what it says in the Hebrew. You shall not keep on murdering because we're murderers in our heart. That man, Dennis, he killed all those people in Kansas. When his family found out that he was the one, they were absolutely just devastated and they became victims like all the rest they became victims you shall not keep on murdering because we are murderers in our heart you shall not keep on committing adultery because we are adulterers in our heart you shall not keep on stealing because we're thieves in our heart a lot easier to steal than it is to work hard for it, isn't it? Some people, if they sweat at, at, at labor, their sweat would cure leprosy, as Marilyn has said many times. <laughs> or some of her family were like that. Some of mine are like that. Their sweat would cure leprosy. You shall not keep on bearing fault witness against your neighbor. You shall not keep on doing it because you're a liar in your heart. We're all guilty of all of this. Well, I don't do that. In your heart, do you? In your heart, do you do that? Jesus in the New Testament really gets plain. Yes, we do. We covet. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. You shall not covet his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. This just about covers it all, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Now let's go to the New Testament and let's meet some of these real bad people. Real bad people. Real bad people. 
Joseph Smith was a real bad person. He was a card artist, and he was, a, he was what we might call, call an emissary of Satan to take God's people away from God's churches and take them into something where they will be damned. Charles Taze Russell did the same thing. Muhammad has done the same thing. Muhammad has damned more people than any human being in the world as far as I know for a long, long time. Catholicism has done the same thing. Catholicism. I think a person could be saved in the Catholic Church if they believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and got around all of that facade of foolishness and sacraments and down to the grace of God down to the grace of God. person could be Erasmus. Constantine Erasmus of the place where he lived. Brought her down. He wanted to bring now he's a Catholic, he's a Catholic priest. He never practiced a Catholic priest but he's a Catholic theologian. He tried to bring the Catholic people and the Catholic priests and the Catholic bishops and archbishops and all that which is uh, what we call a make-believe situation there because there aren't any. Yet they have made men that way. He tried to bring them back to the Word of God. Now, Jerome's a translation of the Latin Vulgate was looked upon as Jerome was inspired of God. The Hebrew Old Testament and the Greek New Testament are inspired of God. Though in the languages that they were, the Bible is inspired, tense, mode, and voice. But in every other thing, it's a translation, and, and the Latin Vulgate's a translation. Erasmus took the Greek because Jerome had translated the Latin Old and New Testament from the Greek Old Testament and the Greek New Testament. Erasmus translated or, or put together a Greek text and tried to correct it the best he could to so give us one close to the original letters as he could. One of the first great what we call critical scientists, textual critics. And he looked at the Greek and then he looked at the Jerome's translation of the Latin Vulgate. He said, I can do better. Would you like me to do this for you? And the cat said, oh, oh, there, boy. Jerome was inspired. I can do it better. He was a greater Latin scholar than Jerome was and a greater Greek scholar than Jerome was. He said he didn't uh, study Hebrew because he said there was only so much room in his brain and he used it all up. He tried to bring people back to the Word of God. The Word of God is our rule of faith and practice. That's what it is. We looked in the Old Testament and we saw what God demands of our lives. Because we are bad. Thou shalt not keep on lying. Thou shalt not keep on stealing. Thou shalt not keep on committing adultery. Thou shalt not keep on killing. Thou shalt not keep on coveting. That's what it says in Hebrew. Because we're we are all of those things. Now let's look at the spiritual leaders in the land of Palestine when Jesus walked the ground. Jesus, the very Son of God. Chi Metabas, Ekathan, Elthain, Aistain, Sinagogain, Alton. Now there's some little words in here that are really very important. And having removed from there, and that's what Jesus said, the Son of Man is Lord God of the Sabbath, is what he said. The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. That was our same, our last message. And having removed from there, he came to the synagogue, to unto the synagogue, belonging to them, the spiritual leaders. It wasn't God's synagogue, it was their synagogue. They decided to have synagogues when they were in Babylon. We have the Babylonian Talmud, which I have at home. We have this Babylonian Talmud. It's how to, what the Bible says. It's how to interpret the Bible. I look at that. 
I can look at the Hebrew Bible, and the Hebrew Bible is pretty plain. But then the Jews decided they're, they're, they have been cast out into the world. The Jews have been cast out into the world to convert the world to be that wonderful influence in the world. That's why God put them out in the diaspora. Why the Jews went out of the diaspora is because they were sinners and rebelled against God and they were being punished. They got out there in, this, in Babylonia and by the way they'd been scattered plumb all over the world. Plumb all over the world. That's okay, you know, plumb. Plumb everywhere. They said that we're out here so we could be great examples to the world. You know what the world sees of them? They're thieves and liars and cheats. They took over their country's banking systems and they robbed them and, and cheated them and, and controlled them. And they're not far wrong in some ways. The synagogues, the word synagoge, that's Greek. That's not moed in Hebrew. And synagogue because they weren't using Hebrew, they were using Greek. Koine Greek. All you people out there, the New Testament was written in Greek. The Old Testament translation of the Hebrew Bible was the Septuagint that they were using. That was a common translation, as common as the King James Version is today. Well, was, let's put it that way. It's kind of, we're drifting away from that because we have better translation. 12 and verse 10. Kai edu anthropos, kera ekon zeron kai epirotason alton legontes e exesten toy sabatu sabusen therapuse hina kata or kat teg gor re sosen altu. And behold, man. Behold a man, a hand having dried out. It's deformed and crippled. Doesn't know whether it's the right hand or his left hand. But his hand is dried out and he's, and he's crippled. And uh, they questioned, they interrogated him. Now they saw this crippled man there in the, or around the synagogue. And the outer edges of the synagogue. And then they look at Jesus, and what are they doing in their heart? They're looking at Jesus with murder in their hearts, because these were murderers. Murder in their hearts. Serial killers. This is who they are, because that's what they are. They kept on interrogating him, saying, If it is lawful, in the Sabbath, or during the Sabbath, to heal. That word therapeusin. Therapeuse. In order that they might accuse him. Accuse him? Mm -hmm. They might want to murder him. They want to murder him, Marilyn. Yeah, they do. Cedric, they want to murder Jesus. Eric, they want to murder Jesus. Donald, they want to murder Jesus. These are our murderers. Thou shalt not keep on murdering. Thou shalt not keep on coveting. Thou shalt not keep on stealing. Thou shalt not keep on lying. And thou shalt not keep on bearing false witness. Because they were liars and cheats. And now they're going to... All of this... All of these terrible deeds that mankind can do to one another, they're going to do it. And not only are they going to do it, they are the spiritual leaders of these people. Mm -hmm. But it said it's in their synagogues, not God's synagogues. The, you know, the devil's got a lot of churches in the world today. Got a lot of them. He's got a lot of churches in the world today. How could these people be so bad? The BTK killer was a president of the Lutheran church where he lived, he raised his family, he took him to church, was a, was a leader in the church, was a leader in the Boy Scouts, and yet he was a murderer, and we see the same kind of people here. 
if Sir William Gall was the Jack the Ripper that murdered all these girls, five women, if he was that person, he was a murderer. He's supposed to be saving lives because that was his job, to save lives as a doctor, as a surgeon. But he was a murderer. Spiritual leaders should not be murderers. They should be saving people's lives, pulling them out of the fire. And, the, and James says that they, you can smell the, the literally fires of hell and smoke on them as, they, as you pull them out. Because we all deserve to go to hell, don't we? We are all thieves and liars and cheats. We are all that way. But by the grace of God. But by the grace of God. Now these people here, the Word of God is not touching their wicked black hearts. The Word of God is not influencing them to the good at all. The Word of God that they're just used, going to use this church out as a vehicle of murder and debauchery. It is lawful during the Sabbath to heal in order that they might accuse Him. They might have some evidence against Him. Verse number 11. Ho de et pen altois tis este, ek himon anthropos hos exe throbaton hen kai yan em pese autu toi sabasun ace buthun non uke kratese alto kai egare. But the one he said to them, Who he shall who shall there be out of among you a man who he shall have sheep probaton one? And if it may fall this one in the in the ditch in a muddy hole, a mud hole, during the Sabbath, and into the ditch, not he shall lay hold of it, and he shall raise it up. Mary, you've been around a lot of shepherds, haven't you? Yes. Do they have any days off? No. No. Sheep always need watching. You know, last year, I did 372 recordings. That's a little more than one a day. All of my little sheep out there, I've been trying to watch over you. I'm trying to feed you in every way. I don't know whether you can stay up with all this preaching or not. But anyway, it's your food. That which you may eat. That's what you can eat. Even the ox that would tread out the wheat and the barley God told him, don't you muzzle the ox. You let him eat as he's walking and as he's working. Now, he said here, you're a shepherd. And if one of your sheep falls in the ditch or gets caught in a thicket or something, as a shepherd, should you go get them out? Should you go get them out? He shall lay hold of it and he shall raise it up out of the ditch. Shepherds have to work on the Sabbath. For sheep have to be watched always. Mm -hmm. No day off. All. all you people out there working dairies, how many days off do you get? How many days off do the cows get? The cows have to be milked two times every day. They don't get a day off. I told Marilyn a long time ago, you know, I'd get a cow and milk it, but I said, you know what, we couldn't go anyplace. <laughs> We'd have no days off because that cow's got to be milked. I had four goats one time, and I had to milk those goats morning and night whether I wanted to or not, whether I was sick or well or whatever. You have to take care of them. 
If they had a cow back then, they were milking, they had to milk that cow two times a day for the cow's sake, not for them. Yeah. I'll tell you something. You might have been a master of a great farm, but you had to have your servants all let, let, let them off on that day. Maybe you had to milk the cow. Mm -hmm. Verse number 12. Poso un dia ferre anthropos probato hoste existen toi sabat susan sabusan des kalos poyen. Therefore, that little oom there, little particle. Therefore, by how much more he goes beyond. That would mean the word. It means to carry beyond. Dia through dia and federal means to carry through and beyond. A man. A man to God is more important than a sheep, if you can imagine that. A man to God is more important than sheep. That doesn't mean sheep's not important. Now, there's a lot of children in the world today. Now, if you're a normal person, maybe. Some people aren't that way. Your mother and your father love you, if they're normal. Now, a person, a mother or father, can see somebody else's child run over, or killed, or raped, or murdered, and it's really bad. But if it is their child, to them, it is much worse. You can cry, you can feel sorry about it. I remember one time, a long time ago, because I'm an old man. A friend of mine came over, a man that I was working with in the church, New Hope Missionary Baptist Church at that time. And I was the pastor of that church, and I had a man that was helping me. Uh, we were going out that day to go house to house and, and to uh, have children come and we were going to pick them up on the bus and we are going to take them to church and we are going to preach the Word of God to them. And uh, my son, Jimmy, who I love very dearly, he came up riding his bicycle. He said, Dad, can I go down the street and visit my friend? And I said, be careful, son. Be careful. And so he left, and after a few minutes, we had prayer, and we were going to go out and visit people and try to lead some of them to the Lord, if at all possible. Try to witness to them, try to bring their kids to church, and, and try to give them spiritual instruction, at least. And when I pulled out of the driveway in my place over there in East Bakersfield, east of Bakersfield, actually, I looked down there and, the, and there was a whole lot of people gathered around. And as I got closer to where that happened, there was a bicycle that had been run over. And a car was on top of the bicycle. Hmm. Can you imagine how my heart felt? I will never forget that day, ever. Never will I ever forget that day. And I come there and I came out of that car and tears were running down my eyes. My heart was palpitating. I was in great fear for my son's life. And then I saw him standing over there and sitting on his bicycle. And I said, oh God, thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord. I was still sad. But now it was somebody else's child. Mm -hmm. And I dealt with them. The little boy was a seriously, seriously hurt. The car had run over him and his bicycle. Somebody came out of a driveway too fast, not looking where they were going. I had great pain in my heart still. But I just about, my heart almost failed me when I thought it was my son. God made man in his image, in his image he made him, he them. The man of this world are made in God's image and he loves 
that which is made in his image. Animals are not really made in the image of God, yet he loves them. But you, if you're born again, are a child of God. And every person out there, other human beings in this world, Jesus Christ died for their sins. All of them. I'm not talking about universalism either. I'm talking about the, that the cross of Calvary was sufficient. The death of Christ was sufficient to save all men. It is efficacious only to those that believe. But Jesus Christ died that all men, even these rats that we're talking about here, these rats. I read you to Exodus the 20th chapter to begin with to show you the background of this. The Sabbath is to, is to protect the sheep, the goats, the ox, the cattle, the donkeys, and your workers to give you rest. God gives you a day of rest a week. Mankind would not do that. If it was up to mankind, a man and a woman would be worth set working seven days a week and barely making a wage because that's the way they want it. You only educate the masses with enough education to go to work at a menial job. You send your sons as ruling elite to the great colleges so that they can be replacing you as the ruling elite when they're done. How much therefore surpasses the man than sheep, so that it is lawful in the Sabbath, good to do. So it is, if it's lawful to save a sheep out of danger during the Sabbath, and sheep are loved by God, but man are made in his image, how much more lawful is it to save that sick, weak, diseased, crippled man? But yet their dark hearts, their black hearts, would not allow them because they were breaking all of those commandments they were teaching in the synagogue. Tot, lege to anthropo, ectenon su ten kera, kai exetenen, kai apikates tethe, higes, hos, he, ala. Ale. <coughs> then he says to the man, to this diseased man, to this crippled man, you stretch out of you the hand. Stretch it out now. It had been crippled up like this. Now he can stretch it out. And it's stronger than it ever was. Stretch out the hand of you and he stretched it out. And <coughs> here we have the word apo ka te se te. It is apo and ka the and histamine. Let it stand down from paralyzation. Let it stand down from paralyzation to be a healthy hand. And it was restored. Now that's all in that word right there. Let it stand down from a diseased, crippled hand and let it become healthy as the other. As the other hand. The Lord wants to heal you spiritually. He wants to change your life. He wants to help you go through life. By the Word of God, we see ourselves as we are. We're all like these wicked people, except for the grace of God. Has God saved your soul? Has He touched your heart with His Spirit? Is He leading you in paths of righteousness? Is He? Let's go back to the Old Testament for just a moment, one more time. And look at one little thing. Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. 
He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet water. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. That's why you do the good things you do in your life. That's why you change your life. A lot of people use their testimony as their witness. I proceed to use the word of God. We can use many, many testimonies. And they are, they are true and they're wonderful. And it is a, an act of going from darkness into light. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and we do. You know, I think many times of my life and how that I've been so close to death so many times. <coughs> so close to death so many times. Thousands of times in my life. I'm knocked out of a drill and rig, Derek and caught myself falling down. I was knocked out. They didn't know I was up there riding blocks up there. They told me to do that, but the hole was tight coming out and he started sputting the thing and I was on the elevators. And he didn't look up. Could have killed me. I should have got killed then. Standing on the rig floor one time, we were pulling in 12 inch casing, putting it in, in the ground, screwing it together. And it, a, 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 one of those 30 foot, 40 foot long casings, the thread protector got caught on the catwalk. And it came real high in the air. Again, he wasn't looking. And it came and fell down like this and went like a bullet. I jumped against the rail on the, uh, on the floor, the drilling wood, on the drilling rig floor, back as far as I could jump, and it ripped my shirt off of me. It caught me. If I had been one more, two more inches, I would have been cut in two. I was going down the road one time, my known business, I once picked up some walnuts. I was driving a one ton Jeep pickup, heavy Jeep pickup. And a guy was coming at me, I was going 45 miles an hour, a guy was coming about 90 miles an hour, maybe 95. He was drinking. He had been to his daughter's wedding. Mm. He was driving an Oldsmobile 98. A dog, somebody's dog that they let out, great big giant wolf dog, about 200 pounds or more. Big hybrid. Chasing the rabbit, came out of the tall weeds right in front of my car, hit the car, he knocked the car completely sideways, and this guy never even saw me coming. And we hit almost head on. It killed him instantly. Mm -hmm. I had both hands on the steering wheel and my foot on the brake. I pushed and broke the steering column or bent the steering column, and I pushed the steering wheel through the windshield. Let me say I'll hang on to it. My knee went into the dash and bent the dash, and it was a key in the dash, and the key was in my knee. My hands were all full of glass. My pickup went back backwards faster than it was going forward. I didn't think it'd ever stop. When I got out, I opened the door, and it had no front end on the Jeep. There's no front end on it. It's gone. The engine was laying over here. Tires, wheels, transmission everywhere. It was the impact was so great. You mechanics out there, it knocked the ring gear off the flywheel mm -hmm. and broke the transmission belt housing. Pieces of everything all over the place. Mm -hmm. And I walked over there, and the man was dead, and the dog was whippering and going on. People were more and more worried about the dog than they were. The dog caused the man's life that time. Even though I walked through the valley of the shadow of death, six years ago, almost seven years ago, my wife's family poisoned me with arsenic and mercury. 
because they thought she had money and they wanted it. And I had cut them off when we got married. She was supporting them. I had enough mercury and arsenic in me to kill nine people, they said. I'm still shaking over that mercury. My circulatory system is destroyed with the arsenic. I went blind. I had people get people to come up and read my text for me. If you watched me back then, for the first three years after that, I couldn't read. Couldn't see that well. Couldn't focus. I could only read my big writing in my Greek. I did too much Greek and Hebrew. God wasn't finished with me yet, and yet I am still a sinner, saved by grace. But God saw fit. Now that is just some of the things. Not all. I got a tumor in my chest on my esophagus right against the aorta. Got two leaky valves in my heart. Got arrhythmia. I have cancer. They radiated me and tore up my guts and everything else in me with radiation. I'm still alive today. I won't be forever. I'm not... Sometimes my boys, I've been so tough in life. Of all the things I've been through, I've been run over by horses and stomped and run over by cars and shot, stabbed, and all kinds of things. Too many gun fights with the gangsters. You got a right to defend yourself, by the way, people. I did. I have. You don't have to be a victim. <laughs> Fight your way through it. Been through all these things and they said, oh, Dad, you're never going to die. <laughs> oh yeah, I will. Sometimes, some days I feel like I want to make it. When I go to bed at night time, when all that poison was in my system, the doctors I thought I was dying and everything, they didn't know what was wrong with me until they finally did a blood test. They said, you've been poisoned. What am I... One of my ham radio friends that I talk to on the radio is a judge in Superior Court in Orange County. I told him what happened to me. He said, I was on a trial. I, I proceeded over a trial where this man had killed his wife with arsenic little by little. He said, that was a rough case because, boy, it's real hard to prove that. Mm -hmm. They really did a good job. I didn't think they could get caught. Well, it didn't kill me. Not, not instantly, anyway. i preached about a thousand messages since then, or more. And every day I think I ought to be doing something for the Lord because this may be my last day. What are you going to do with the last day you're on this earth? Fiddling around, fooling around, doing something useless or something in God's will. We're all accountable for every day we live. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. God's going to take care of you. Mm -hmm. You may not think he's going to do it. I remember coming up here about a year ago, Fish Lake Valley. It's so expensive to live down in California, we have to live up here because we don't have enough money to live down there. So we just do as little down there as we possibly can. We come up here. We don't live in good circumstances. But I came up here at that time where we were absolutely maxed out on everything we had. I had no, money, no way to get home. And the website means so much to me. And I keep begging God to help us keep it up, to help people send money. And that day I came up here, I had no money to buy food, I had no money to buy gasoline. And all the time I was coming up here, coming up Highway 395, I got to Bishop, California. I had a little bit, one last credit card, and I filled my car up with gas. The next time I tried to use it, at smart and final, it didn't work, it was done. No money. And I didn't know I put almost all of my money in the website, about $500 that month, to keep for you could hear the God's Word. And I got here. 
And I said, Lord, here I am. What are you going to do next? Because I sure have nothing else. I have nothing. I have, don't have anything to eat. Nothing. We're done. Had a few little, I mean, I did have a little tiny bit to eat. I mean, we only had enough for a day or two. But I was worried. And I got up here and turned on the computer and zip! There's a donation. I said, wow, Lord, that's a hundred dollars. You know, Lord, I need a whole lot more than that. In zip, about one hour later, there's a thousand dollars. And thank you, you out there that did that. And I couldn't believe my eyes. Then a few days later, here comes some more, here comes some more, here comes some more. I didn't have to worry about putting all my last dollar into the website. Now God's people were taken care of. I just couldn't believe it. And yet I asked for it. I asked the Lord to help me. Thy rod and thy staff, they come from me. That protective rod, all the things. I've had, how many contracts have I had out on me that we know about, Meryl? Mm -hmm. huh? Four, five, six? Maybe six. That's my deaths, people. People trying to kill me. And me. And you. Yeah. Yeah. Me before we met. <laughs> and, then, and then I got a whole other side of a family after me after I married you. Double trouble. Well, I pulled them though. <laughs> yeah. Well, we laugh about it now. Thy rod and thy staff, they come from me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You're feeding me when the jackals and the hyenas and the coyotes and wolves are looking at me. The bear is at the door. The wolf is at the door. You have anointed my head with oil, and my cup overflow. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever after I leave this old world. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Oh, what a promise. Do you have that promise? Is God your God? Is He your personal friend? Is He? Our Heavenly Father, we send Your Word out. We pray that it will touch people's lives and, and nurture them, feed them. Your Word and, and the experiences that Jesus went through, the hyenas were at His feet, at His heels. And yes, they did crucify Him on the cross of Calvary. And yes, He did give His life for us. Father, we have all different lots in life, but I ask You to watch over my students wherever they are. Help them through whatever hard times they're going through. And help them to be thankful for the good times if they're having them. I have met a few people that had good lives all their lives and no problems. And I so much envy them that thou shalt not covet. But boy, do I covet their lives. I could sure use a lot less excitement. Father, lead them. Help them to be thankful every day. Help them to give and help them to love you more. Father, thank you for all those you've given me to be my sheep all over the world and in my little church. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.